the first speaker is uh, Anna Koriani from Princeton. The title of the lecture is the Weight Monodromy Conjecture. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, <coughs> Peter's proof of the Weight Monodromy Conjecture for hypersurfaces in projective space. Uh, so you know it's more general than that, but I'll focus on that case. And um, for that, we're going to want to uh, look at kind of compare uh, topological spaces in, of, say, varieties and projective space in particular and characteristic zero and then characteristic p. But we also want to compare um, the et al topoi, and so the et al sites. Um, so I'll start by just recalling some of the things that we've seen um, so far. Sorry. Um, so the tilting equivalents. We're just start with K, a perfectoid field, so a complete uh, non-Archimedean field uh, equipped with a non-discrete valuation of rank zero, of uh, rank one, sorry, and such that um, Frobenius uh, from the integral elements mod pi to the integral elements mod pi is surjective. And pi is going to be some sort of quasi-uniformizer in this field K it's going to have absolute value uh, less than 1 and greater than or equal to the absolute value of uh, p. So that, you know, if we look here, uh, Frobenius is a, uh, is a homomorphism. All right. Um, so k, this tilts to k flat. It's a perfectoid field of characteristic 0, uh, characteristic p. I'm sorry. OK, um, and we can identify the tilt with the inverse limit over Frobenius of k. Um, so this is the map x goes to x to the p. And if we project to k, uh, then we get a map x goes to x sharp. This is a continuous multiplicative homomorphism, but um, it's not additive. And also, um, it's very far from surjective, and that's part of the problem. OK, so the idea is um, to identify, basically, uh, well, topological spaces. So in this case, I guess we just have uh, k circ, that's just one point. But that gets identified with k flat, k flat circ, in such a way that the structure sheaves um, are identified under tilting. So k, k circ tilts to k flat, k flat circ. Um, and so there's something on topological spaces, uh, structure sheaves, and also at all sites. So this is the kind of the baby case of almost purity says that finite et al. Uh, algebras over k, so, or sorry, finite extensions, there's an equivalence of categories between finite extensions L over k and finite extensions L flat over k flat. OK, um, and that leads, so the fact that you have, this is the kind of equivalence of et al sites, and that leads to an isomorphism on the Galois groups, um, k bar over k isomorphic to the Galois group of k flat. OK, um, so now this is just for perfectoid fields. But we can also look at perfectoid spaces. Over, say, um, perfectoid base k. So if x is a perfectoid space over a perfectoid base k, x is uh, an attic space that's locally isomorphic to so something like spa of R. R is the perfectoid k algebra. R plus 
um, R plus is an open and integrally closed subring of the integral elements, uh, power bounded elements R circ. Um, so we have perfectoid spaces X over K, and these will tilt to perfectoid spaces over K flat. Um, and locally, they will look like spa um, R flat, R flat plus. Okay. Um, so if you just look at, so these will be our affinoid, these are our affinoid perfectoids. Okay. So just on such, an, such a perfectoid K algebra, we've seen that the same kind of uh, continuous multiplicative uh, homomorphism exists. So if you look at R flat, uh, you can identify that with the inverse limit x goes to x to the p r. And if you project to the last coordinate, um, then you get this map sharp. So I'll say f in here gets mapped to f sharp in here. Again, it's continuous. It's multiplicative. It's far from surjective, but at least mod pi. So, oh, I must have forgotten to say. So there's some element pi flat in here such that its sharp is pi. And, you know, if its sharp is something that differs from pi by a unit, I just redefine pi. Okay, so this is continuous, multiplicative, not surjective, but induces an isomorphism. Uh, R plus mod pi is isomorphic to R flat plus mod. Okay, um, so we have something like this. This, as you've seen, allows us to also compare the topological spaces. So if you have, um, you can define a map x from x to x flat that sends a point of the space to the point that's defined by, for any f, say this is defined locally in R, um, f of x flat is defined to be f sharp of x. Um, okay, so this is a map of topological spaces. And you can prove that it's a homeomorphism. And um, it identifies rational subsets. So in order to see that it identifies rational subsets, well, you have to remember that rational subsets are defined by certain inequalities. And if you define an inequality here using, say, f and g, then first of all, you have to approximate f and g to, you know, to show, like, you have to show that that rational subset can also be defined in terms of sharps. So for that, you need to use some sort of approximation lemma that I'll make precise later. But the idea behind this approximation lemma is that given f, say, in R plus, you can find g in R flat plus such that um, f is equal to G sharp, um, except when both are very small. So except when F is less than some epsilon, uh, then G will also be less than some epsilon. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, here I want to take F in R flat. Yes, thank you. Right. Um, okay, so we have a homeomorphism on topological spaces. Um, the structure sheaves OX and OX plus are related by tilting with the structure sheaves of X flat, OX flat, and OX flat plus. Um, so that on an affinoid perfectoid, you actually have, I guess, OX of U, um, OX plus of U tilts to the corresponding thing for X flat. Um, and, okay, 
And moreover, we've seen that these are actually sheaves. So they're not just free sheaves in the case of perfectoid spaces. Okay, um, so that allows us to compare topological spaces with their analytic topology. And then Peter also talked about um, the atal topology. So an atal morphism is just going to be um, something that's, um, so for perfectoid spaces which are not reduced, um, you define it by saying that it's a composition of a finite atal map with an open immersion. Um, and then um, you can, as you've seen, uh, finite, you can con compare finite at all. Um, so finite at all spaces over x with finite at all spaces over x flat. So you get an isomorphism of at all sites. X um, at all with x flat at all. And I just want to recall that um, kind of the key point here was that locally um, you could kind of, you can get something finite at all. You can show that something finite at all over uh, x, over say some point x in x, um, comes from the course, a corresponding finite at all here, uh, finite at all thing here by uh, using the fact that, so you do this locally, and you use the fact that the completion of um, the stock, so you take this complete and invert P, and that's isomorphic, so to the completion of uh, the residue field at the point x. And moreover, these are perfectoid fields. And then you reduce um, the proof of, so you reduce the proof of almost purity to almost purity for perfectoid fields this way. And this is something that's special about, um, well, I guess, perfectoid spaces, but also this this thing also holds for general, in general for analytic attic spaces. So the attic spaces that we're considering. Okay. Um, it's, I guess every point has to have a neighborhood where um, you have a topologically nilpotent unit. So I think that's what Eugen de defined in his talk yesterday. Um, OK. So, oh, and then the sheaf property is crucial here. So the sheaf property is used to glue. I just want to recall this because, yeah, it seems like. It's a yes, it's missing. Um, sheaf property is used to glue. Okay, um, all right, so now we can, basically, we have a way of comparing uh, perfectoid spaces in characteristic zero to perfectoid spaces in characteristic P. So, um, you know, we can compare their topological spaces, we can compare their et al. sites, but if our goal is to uh, get to the weight monodromy conjecture, then what we really want to do is uh, compare these with, um, at all sites and topological spaces of locally Noetherian attic spaces. Okay. Um, and the example, I guess, that I want you guys to keep in mind is that you can say if you look at projective space over um, perfectoid field K, then you can define an attic space uh, just associated to projective space. So this is glued out of um, you know 
athenoids. So the attic space is just uh, associated to affine spaces in the usual way. But you can also, so glued out of things that are like spa, um, K, T1, Tn, K0, T1, Tn, um, in the usual way. But you can also look at perfectoid space. Uh, so this is glued out of spa k t1 1 over p infinity tn 1 over p infinity and then k naught t1 1 over p infinity. So in characteristic p, you could get this from this one just by taking the completed perfection. And in characteristic zero, basically you have to take lots of piece power roots. So this is the setting that we have in mind. Um, I'm going to make a formal definition. So let's say that x uh, over k is a perfectoid space. And xi over k are locally, uh, or just, I guess, Noetherian attic <coughs> spaces. If uh, I precompose this with an automorphism of Pn, yeah, I think that should. Uh, yeah, no, I, that, 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 that's what I meant. Sorry, I, I didn't mean that we actually do this. I just meant that. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was that if you precompose this with an automorphism of K, do you still get? Uh, of P. Sorry, of Pn, do you still get um, perfectoid space? Uh, do you still get the same thing? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so this is just uh, kind of the example that I want people to have in mind, but I'll make the uh, formal definition now. So x over k is a perfectoid space. Xi, this is um, so this is a filtered inverse system. of Noetherian attic spaces. And equipped with maps, uh, phi i, a compatible system of maps, phi i from x to x i. Um, okay. Then we say that um, X is similar to the inverse limit of the XI if um, the following two conditions are satisfied. So if you look at the topological space associated to X, um, so that has to be, so that has an induced map to the inverse limit of the topological spaces associated to the xi's. Um, this is a homeomorphism. Right. And the second condition is a condition on residue fields. So for any point x 
of x, you get induced points xi of xi, um, and you get an induced map from the direct limit of the residue fields of the points xi to the residue field of, point, of the point x, and this should have dense image. Okay, um, and the reason that we want this condition is kind of similar to the reason why um, the completed residue fields show up in the proof of almost purity, which is that you know ultimately what we want to do is uh, compare uh, et al topoi, and one question is whether you know if you have say a finite et al morphism here, can you always descend it to finite level and because of this property on the residue fields, um, that the completion of the residue field is the, completion, is the same as the completion of the stock at the point x, um, it's enough to require this type of thing in order to descend finite etal morphisms to finite level. OK, so this is what we mean by something being similar. And as a remark, uh, no, that if y over xi is an et al morphism of attic spaces, then um, you can look at um, the fiber product of y over xi with x and y xi xj um, inverse limit over, say, j greater than uh, i, then this is similar. Uh, I guess we'll, we define them just as we did for perfectoid spaces as a composition of an open immersion and uh, finite atomorphism. I think Huber shows that. But, yeah. But I guess for, the, for our purposes today, we use that as our definition. All right. Um, so as I said, the key example of this is uh, the projective perfectoid space. So um, let's take um, well, let's look at Pn k perfectoid. Uh, so this is over k. K tilts to k flat. We have the following theorem. First of all. Uh, this tilts to Pn k flat perfectoid. Uh, the reason for that is that um, you can check this on affinoid pieces. Uh, this perfectoid projective space is glued out of affinoids. So check this on uh, the affinoid pieces. And there, all you have to check by the tilting equivalence is that, um, I guess, k naught mod pi t1 p infinity tn 1 over p infinity is the same as the same thing with a flat. thing that we want is basically this type of relationship so that we want to know that um, the perfectoid projective space is similar to an inverse limit of attic projective spaces. Perfect. 
side. And our limit for map phi of Pn k attic, where this map phi is on coordinates defined as taking x0, xn to um, x0 to the p, xn to the p. Okay? Um, so again, this is something that you can check on affinoid pieces. Um, third thing is that there are homeomorphisms of topological spaces. Um, so, on one hand, we have Pn k flat attic. So, attic projective space over k flat, we look at its topological space. Um, one thing that I forgot to say so, if you're in characteristic, so if um, all your maps are, so all the maps between the xi's are homeomorphisms of topological spaces. And if these transition maps are purely inseparable, then you can show that um, the top, so then you have a homeomorphism of topological spaces in particular. Um, this is the case when you look at the map phi and you're in characteristic p, so you're, not, you're on the tilt. This is isomorphic to uh, the inverse limit of the topological spaces associated to this under the map phi, which is Pn k flat perf. All right, so this follows from part two. And the fact that you're in characteristic p, so this map induces a homeomorphism on topological spaces. Um, now, this is isomorphic to Pn k perf topological space. This is by the tilting equivalence. And then finally, that's isomorphic to the inverse limit under phi. we have in the end is we can identify uh, the topological space associated to the projective space over the tilt k flat with an inverse limit of the topological spaces of projective space over k under this map phi. So um, if you want to look at it in terms of, say, uh, classical points or maximal ideals, if um, you have, so on uh, coordinates, well, okay, you can project this further to P and K attic. And on coordinates, what's happening is that you're looking at X0, Xn, that gets mapped to X0 sharp, Xn sharp. Um, if these are in some finite extension of k flat, this will be in the corresponding finite extension of um, k. Yeah. So the question is whether the projective linear group over Fp acts on uh, on the projective space over k flat. Uh,
I guess, sorry, I'm not sure off the top, but I, I think it should, right? Yeah, I mean, just because this is defined in terms of, just like. Doesn't doesn't act on PN over K, but it does act on PN over K flat. That's what the question is. Well, I mean, it acts on, on the infinite level. Oh, oh, yeah, sure, yeah. So it acts on the infinite level uh, perfectoid space, but not on this over K, because you have an equivalence of categories. OK. Um, so. Finally, so we have a way of uh, comparing topological spaces. We have this kind of projection map from um, Pn k flat to Pn k, but there's also uh, something on et al. topoi. So there is an isomorphism of et al. topoi uh, between the et al. topoi associated to Pn k flat, um, et al. topos associated to Pn k flat, and the projective limit of the fiber topos um, associated to these Pn k um, under the map phi. So they're equipped with this system of maps phi. Um, and in order to prove this, yeah, the, kind of the key is to use this uh, condition on residue fields in order to descend finite et al. morphisms. OK. Um, and moreover, if you restrict to some subset, Sorry? What was the question? The twiddle. It just means we're looking at the atal topos uh, instead of the atal site. So we're. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fibered limit of, uh, it's, it's a projective limit of a fibered topos, but in this case, it would just mean a compatible system of um, sheaves on the PNs. Um, OK. And finally, if so, if u is in Pn k attic, and this has pi inverse of u, let me call this map pi. So this is a homeomorphism of topological spaces. Let's take pi to just be the projection onto the last coordinate, Pn k flat attic. To Pn k. So this map here, let's call this pi. Pi inverse of u is v. Um, okay, if you have this, then um, there's a commutative diagram of topoi. follows from uh, the fact that, I guess, if you're similar and you have an etal morphism, then phase changing by that will also give you things that are similar. And going through these constructions for u and v. All right. And as a corollary, so if you can compare etal topoi on these sides, then you can also compare, so you can get something about the et al. cohomology. So as a corollary, I'll say that um, h i p n k flat attic um, et al. 
with coefficients in z mod L to the mz is isomorphic to hi p to the n k adic et al z mod L to the mz. So here, I don't have an inverse limit because already on the map of attic spaces, there, there was um, an induced, uh, so the induced map on residue fields was purely inseparable. So we already had an isomorphism at the level of et al topoi. Here, the reason the inverse limit goes away is that, so a priori you would have an inverse, or I guess this would turn into a direct limit with respect to this map phi. But um, in this case, oh, let me assume that k, k flats are algebraically closed. Um, projective space is proper and smooth. So by proper and smooth base change, you can compute this cohomology on the special fiber. And there, the map phi is purely inseparable. So that's why the inverse limit, like every, kind of, every map induces an isomorphism on cohomology. And that's why the inverse limit goes away here. OK, so just to summarize before I uh, move on to talking about the weight monodromy conjecture. So, so far, we have a projection pi on topological spaces of these attic spaces. And the projection looks something like this. So, you know, far from surjective um, and doesn't kind of, you know, these maps, again, they're not additive. Um, and we have a comparison of et al cohomology. All right, so using these ingredients, you can give a proof of the weight monodromy conjecture for hypersurfaces in projective space. So for that, I want to talk about what the weight monodromy conjecture says. So let's take k to be some local field, either characteristic 0 or characteristic p. I guess um, x over k proper and smooth. So if you look at the et al cohomology of x k bar with coefficients in QL bar, some L not equal to P, this has an action of the absolute Galois group of k bar over k. Um, OK. And yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, uh, I think. Well, it definitely commutes, but I think it should also be a Cartesian product. Is that right? But we, all we need for our purposes is that the diagram commutes. Um, OK, so this et al cohomology has an action of the Galois group of k bar over k. It's a continuous representation of this. Um, and if you want to understand it, so when l is not equal to p, there are basically, you know, up to going to some finite extension, this is characterized by the action of Frobenius. Um, so this is some lift, mm, yeah, we'll lift of Frobenius. So k is our local field. Um, it has a uniformizer pi, has a residue field, say fq, with cardinality q. OK? Um, this representation is characterized by the action of Frobenius and by a nilpotent operator, n, um, which encodes the action of the L part of the tame inertia. So by Grothendieck's elatic monodromy theorem, after going to some finite extension, um, the, you only have an action of the L part. So inertia acts through some uh, subgroup that acts unipotently. And then you define this n as the logarithm um, action of same inertia. OK. So let's call this representation v. So the fact that we have a Frobenius action 
tells us that, uh, well, we can decompose, well, it's not just from the Frobenius action, but we can decompose V as a direct sum from j equals 0 to 2i vi, where um, on each vi, the eigenvalues of Frobenius are uh, phi numbers of weight j. So uh, what that means is that their absolute value is q to the j over 2 for every embedding uh, into the complex numbers. Sorry? Uh, Vj, yes, that's right. So I'm looking at Hi, and I'm decomposing it in terms of the weights uh, that range from 0 to 2i for every uh, complex embedding. Okay, um, so if our uh, variety has smooth reduction, then from the Vey conjectures, we actually know that there's only one weight that can occur. Uh, so if x has good reduction, And that forces uh, the monodromy operator to be zero. So the monodromy operator generally uh, sends, because it's obtained as a logarithm of tame inertia, it satisfies some compatibility with Frobenius. And so it sends Vj to Vj minus 2. It decreases the weight by 2. So this would force the monodromy operator to be zero. However, if you don't have good, if you're not in the good reduction case, you can have more than one weight occur. And then the weight monodromy conjecture says that these weights are connected by the monodromy operator. So somehow that the monodromy operator is the most that it can be. to Deline says that, so if V is obtained as the atal cohomology of a proper smooth variety over a local field K, then um, the J's power of the monodromy operator induces an isomorphism between the I plus J's, uh, I guess, sorry, V I plus J and V I minus J for all j, say, greater than 0, less than or equal to i. Uh, so in general, this will map i plus j, the vi plus j, into vi minus j. But uh, what this is saying is that it always has to be an isomorphism. Um, it's saying that n kind of has to be given the weights, n has to be the most that it can be. Um, it's also another way of thinking about it is you have a nilpotent operator, and you can write down uh, something called a monodromy filtration that's obtained by convolving um, the kernel filtration of this nilpotent operator with the image filtration. So equivalently, the monodromy filtration is a filtration that's uniquely determined by this kind of uh, property. Uh, monodromy filtration is the same as the weight filtration. filtration by weights. Uh, and this is, yeah, I guess, conjectured by analogy with the picture of what happens if you look at um, a projective system of projective varieties over the uh, open uh, unit disk over the complex numbers uh, that is smooth over the punctured unit disk. And over C, this kind of result is known. And moreover, this is also known over uh, finite fields. So let me just 
uh, sorry, over fields that have uh, equal characteristic P. So let me just state what Deline proved. Let C be a curve over FQ. So when um, X is a point of this curve such that K is obtained as the local field of this curve at X, Then, um, and you have x over c minus x smooth, smooth outside this point, then xk satisfies the weight monitor of protection. Um, so now we want to prove that um, you, know, you can reduce, so once this is known, uh, you can reduce the char characteristic zero case of a hypersurface in projective space to this theorem. Uh, yeah, I, you mean showing that this is equivalent to uh, a different form of the weight monitor? Sorry, I didn't understand your question, I guess. Well, I should prove. Uh, to say that this is a direct sum of these things, this is not trivial. Yeah, that's true. But yes. Formally, yeah, that's true. I guess when X has semi-stable reduction, then the rappaport zinc spectral sequence will show you that uh, you can do this for some choice of Frobenius. And then more generally, you would use De Jong's theory of alterations. It's true that I've yeah kind of skipped over that part. It's true. Um, OK, so um, now what we want to do is look at why inside Pn k um, a smooth hypersurface. And we can pass to the attic world. Um, and there's a comparison theorem of the etal cohomology of Y uh, with uh, the etal cohomology of this attic space. Oh, another thing is the weight monodromy conjecture is about um, the monodromy operator and the Frobenius action. And these are still seen if you pass to a perfectoid field. So our local field K, we can adjoin pi to the 1 over P to the infinity and complete, and it suffices to work over this. Suffices to work with. This doesn't kill tame inertia. You can still define uh, the monodromy operator and the weights. OK, so after you do this, um, you have a comparison due to Huber. Um, and in fact, you have a comparison with y tilde, uh, some open neighborhood of y. In attic, in projective space. OK, so what we have is y. Um, that sits inside some open neighborhood Y tilde, which sits inside Pn um, k. Let's work with Cp. So let's move to an algebraically closed perfectoid field. Okay, here we have our projection map Pn Cp flat. Um, this contains pi inverse of y tilde. OK, so 
if y, as you saw in Peter's talk, if y uh, is given by something algebraic, such as, you know, it's just a hyperplane, it's given by something like x plus y plus z equals 0, then y inverse, or pi inverse of y, is like a fractal. It's like an inverse limit of varieties defined by x to the p to the n plus y to the p to the n plus z to the p to the n equals 0. So inverse limit of such things. So the problem with that is that that's not algebraic. So even if we have a way of comparing topological spaces, um, so we could look at the inverse image of y inside this uh, projective space over the tilted field that doesn't actually allow you to go to the weight monodromy, so it doesn't allow you to use uh, Deligne's theorem. However, if you pass to some open neighborhood, then uh, you can find something algebraic um, z, so z algebraic uh, over cp, over the tilted perfectoid field. So uh, you can do this. So the lemma, well, I'll state it imprecisely for now, is that um, there exists, so y, let's say, is cut out by some homogeneous polynomial f of degree d, then there exists some homogeneous polynomial g inside cp flat t1, 1 over p, tn, 1 over p to the infinity. So inside the tilted thing such that g, like the algebraic uh, variety cut out by g equals 0 is contained inside this open neighborhood. And so basically what that means is that, well, we just want f of x less than or equal to epsilon uh, in is equivalent to g sharp of x less than or equal to epsilon for all x in p and cp. Uh, OK, and I guess here we would move to attic. Sorry. Yes. Um, OK, so you want something like this. Um, if you can do this, then you can find something algebraic inside the inverse image under this projection map of the tubular neighborhood of Y. And then, so if you have this, then you get a map from HI Y over CP um, et al. QL bar into HI Z. Et al. QL bar. And OK, this map will be equivariant with respect to the action of the Galois group of k bar over k, isomorphic to the Galois group of k bar flat over k flat. Um, and it will also be compatible with cup product. Uh, uh, this map comes from this diagram. So remember, we actually had a commutative diagram uh, at this level or at the level of etal topoi. Um, now, here, so if you look at etal topoi, you can, well, you can compare etal cohomology of y with the etal cohomology of the tilt of, uh, of this neighborhood by some results of Huber. So Huber gives you way of comparing h i y z mod l to the m z with this isomorphic y tilde for a sufficiently small open neighborhood. Um, and then that maps into the here, which maps into z. So this is where the map comes from. Uh, 
I'm not sure. Does the neighborhood depend on L to the M? Uh, no, actually, because you can prove. Yeah, you, you can prove by induction that if it's true for M equals 1, then it's true for every M. OK. Um, yes, that's true. So in order to reduce to uh, this theorem, actually, what it's enough to show that you can choose your homogeneous polynomial G to be defined over any dense subfield. Um, and that can be done through the approximation lemma just by changing things slightly. So if you just change, you know, what you need is this type of thing. If you just change your G slightly, then you can ensure that it's defined over any um, algebraic, uh, over any dense field. So in particular, uh, over a global field. And you know, you can change Z slightly in order to ensure that it's irreducible and smooth. And so you really, you know, you get something here that satisfies the weight monodromy conjecture. Um, and once you have such a map, as long as you can show that this is a direct summand, um, you get that this has to satisfy the weight monodromy conjecture as well, um, since somehow n is uniquely determined by the weights. Um, so you can do that by using Poincaré duality. But let me just state uh, an approximation lemma first. So um, let f in k naught t 1 over p infinity, or t naught actually, t n be homogeneous of degree d, then for any epsilon and c, there exists a g in same thing, but for flat, t naught 1 over p infinity. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess just an element that's, I mean, it's going to come from a polynomial because G is, but, you know. In some unknown p power root. Yeah, okay. yeah. And similarly, this G could be in some unknown p power roots, but you can always forget them and just change G slightly, and that inequality is still going to be satisfied. Um, so there exists a G such that f of x minus G sharp of x is less than or equal to pi to the 1 minus epsilon plus maximum of pi to the c and f of x. Okay. This is the approximation lemma. If you translate, uh, so if you just try to see uh, what that means, you get that this type of thing. So f is equal to g sharp unless they're both very small. Okay. Um, and I want to say just a word about the proof. So the idea behind proving this, so first of all, you use induction. On C to approximate F by G sharp better and better. And that's the first thing. The base case is given just by the fact that if you set, so if I set this to be R, not, then R not mod pi is isomorphic to R flat not mod pi flat. So you can always approximate something mod pi by a G sharp because of this. Then, you know, there's some almost mathematics involved because this type of relationship tells you that when f is less than some pi to some constant, um, then this type of thing tells you that f minus g is in some pi to the other constant that's slightly larger, ox plus of u. So you have to be a little bit careful uh, and work with almost mathematics. But then you have some description of what this sheaf is like. Um, 
And the idea is to just successively approximate sections of this mod pi. And that always gains you an extra power. And you can do it uh, this way. All right. Uh, and I just want to end with, OK, so assuming that you can approximate it like this, you will you know, get a power series. And you can just change it slightly for it to be a polynomial. You can uh, ensure that it's defined over any dense subfield. And you can even, um, you know, afterwards, since you're in characteristic p, just raise g to the p to some number of p powers so that it's actually a polynomial in the variables t0 through tn. That, that's what defines z. And finally, to conclude, get a map from hi of y. QL bar into HI of Z QL bar. Um, you want to check that this is a direct sum, and it's enough to look at the top degree. Twice the dimension of Y. If you look in the top degree, then the map is either an isomorphism or 0. Uh, however, if the map is 0, then what you can do is you go through this diagram. You take uh, a tall cohomology going through this diagram. And that, remember, at the very top, we had a way of, we had an isomorphism between the tall cohomology of projective space and the tall cohomology of the tilted object over the tilted perfectoid field. So if the map is 0 and you go through the diagram, you get hi um, pn cp flat ql bar to hi z cp flat ql bar has to be 0. And that can't happen because you can just take um, the dimension, so the i, well, i over 2 power of the first churn class associated to an ample uh, line bundle on projective space, and that has to have a non-zero image. So in this case, contradiction. So if you have this, then the map in top degree has to be an isomorphism. And then you use the fact that it's compatible with cup product um, and Poincaré duality to prove that you have a direct summit. Um, that's all. Thank you.